a uh, few announcements. Um, the arts side is open for discussion. Not everyone has um, signed in, so please do. Um, there's now a new site for ticket questions. I've taught um, COGS 300 before, and what's worked really well then is that people give ticket questions um, for the class and help you think about what are, what are interesting questions. You then know the answer to the question that's being on the clicker because you made up the question, and it's a good way to learn about the learn about the course and the content. But it's also good for for me and the other um, teaching staff to know what people understand and don't understand and what they think are interesting. Because me, as an agent observing you, helps me act better. Okay, so I may make observations of you, so it's information that's useful. And also on the Piazza site, there's, um, we're going to start having more questions about assignments, and I often want you to think about it as a way to you to help each other, rather than to have authoritative answers. Because often if I give an answer, then people are only going to look at that answer. But there's going to be times when people want to give suggestions about how to answer something and you don't want an authoritative answer, you just want a way to look at things. So please try to answer questions that you see there. We'll try to get more of a discussion than a place for people who ask questions to get authoritative answers and a way to explore um, issues and ways to do things. Hopefully we can make that more useful than just a way to ask questions to get authoritative answers. Some of the time, if you say, how can I do this? I can't give an authoritative answer because I want you to say, try this and try that. And maybe they're useful for you, but maybe they're not useful, and then you won't try other things. So it's hard for sometimes the, the professors to give good answers to questions because it's going to, then people are going to believe me when maybe they shouldn't. Okay. Um, there are tutorials on tomorrow and Friday. These are really introductory Python tutorials for the people who didn't understand the question gave the very first class that said, did you understand that? And for people who said, I can't work it out for myself, I would probably need a tutorial. It's for those people. There are two rooms we booked. The, room, the Thursday room is much bigger than the Friday. It's bigger than the Friday room. We couldn't get a big room on Friday. So if you can come to the Thursday one, please come. They're both the same. Um, you don't want to come to both. Please install Python 3 and Matplotlib before you come to the tutorial. So it's not going to be about that. And the only thing is, it's just enough to answer the assignment one. Um, chapter 3 is now available. See the website. If you don't know where that website is, where you get the, um, the new versions, then ask me. Um, assignment one's available. A few typos are found. If you're uploaded, it, please reload it. Again. Um, and we're videoing the class. And the idea is we we um, plan to put it on YouTube sometime so that we can watch it. We've had good feed from people so they can re-watch things that they've missed. Okay, so it means that we can have sort of slightly different, so we can have it, so we can assume that we're going to, um, so we have more, assuming that people don't miss out on things, I can actually sometimes go through things more carefully. Whereas you can say, oh, if you don't get that, you can watch it later. Any questions about anything? Okay. So now let's start this. So, what we've done so far is we've looked at the model of an agent that acts in an environment. An agent has access to its abilities, its goals and preferences, its prior knowledge, its observations, and its past experiences. That's this, what the black box of an agent is. We've had seen lots of simplifying assumptions made in studying and designing agents. And we went through some of those simplifying assumptions that give us a, an overview of the course. And there are many applications of AI that are actually used in the world. Okay, does anyone have any questions about any of these? Any of these? Okay. So let's do some review questions. So here's the first questions about 
Actually, it's hard to think of review questions for the day, so uh, we haven't sort of started, we're still, still starting the course today. So, so if you so prior knowledge is not, it's important that it's not. What's programmed into the agent? What an agent gets from experience? What biologies evolve for animals when they're born? What's required for both artificial and natural agents? And what psych psychologists call nature in the nature-nurture debate? So what do we mean by prior knowledge? What's prior knowledge is not, not. Even. Oh. Oh, I didn't even look at it. All right. Good. Everyone knew that. Was good. You like easy All right. Next one. What's the role of data in the applications presented? A. It was all that was needed to get the application work to work. It was ignored in the applications presented. All of the applications required data sets of the size of the set of all photos that were posted on the web. Only expensive proprietary data is useful, and it was used in many applications to improve performance. people, the programmers who built the applications, who spent hours working on these things, that all they needed was data, they would get very upset at you. Um, it sort of implies we don't need programs, we don't need anything else. And some people said, C, some of the things required, some of the applications required this huge data set of all of the photos on the, all the photos that have been published on the web, and, um, but not all of them. Okay, so the answer here was E. And it's sort of interesting how much data people are getting now. Um, so for example, we're actually reaching the limit of a lot of these learning techniques. Um, so in fact, the Google Translate has uses every piece of data that's written that's, that's been translated by humans. So the Canadian, so the the um, Canadian government translates everything between English and French. So it's actually very useful for people to learn. The European community um, publishes everything, publishes all of their documents in multiple languages. And so the whole of data that's been doing, that's been used, and Google Translate and these other translators use all of those things. They've effectively run out of data to use for these things, and so now they have to try different techniques. But they require, but they use huge amounts of data, but we're sort of hitting the limit of how much we can use with data. Uh, so it turns out that people like Google Translate have to stop using more data because nearly all the data that exists is actually stuff they generated themselves and this is pretty bad. So it's the human generated translation, for example. All right, that's it's awesome. Alright, so really today is going to be the first day that we're going to, of the content of this course. The last three lectures were sort of introductory about where we're going. And so what we're going to do is today we're going to define this notion of a directed graph. We're going to talk about a whole lot of ways to represent problems in terms of this state space graph. I'm going to talk a bit about explaining how a generic searching algorithm works. So here's, so, and some pe people often talk about searching as the basis for a lot of the AI systems that exist. And so often we're not given an algorithm to solve a problem, we're given just a specification of what's a solution, and we have to search for a solution. So we're just told, what is a, what's the, what do I'm looking for? 
And we're going to have to then give an algorithm that searches for all of the ways of doing this. So we're not told how, how to solve, but what to solve. And a typical problem is when an agent in one state has a set of deterministic actions and wants to get to the gold state. So it tries to have actions in the world. And we're going to find this many AI problems to abstract the problem of finding a path in a directed graph. And there's often more than one way to represent a problem. And a lot of what we're going to do when we do planning is about different ways of actually representing problems as graphs. When we did the um, dimensions, what we're going to do in this one here, we're going to have the simplest dimension in all cases. We're going to have it it's flat. We're going to talk about, so there's no modularity or hierarchical structure. We're going to have explicit states. It's not going to, it's going to talk about indefinite stages. We're not going to know how many steps into the future we're going to reason forward. We're going to be fully observable. We're going to have a deterministic system. We have goals to achieve. We have a single agent. We're going to assume knowledge is given and perfect rationality. So in some cases, it's the simplest of everything. And later, most of the course is going to start reducing these assumptions about what we're doing. The search is often the basis for a lot of these things. So, so we're going to start off with a state space problem. So it consists of a set of states. And a subset of these states are called start states, where we're going to start from. There's a set of actions. An action function, which given a state and an action returns a new state. So we've got the state, state action function. A set of goal states. We're going to assume we've got a goal function that tells you whether the state is a goal. And a criterion that specifies the quality of an acceptable solution. So we're getting the best solution, the shortest path, or the quickest time, or something like that. Okay. So here's an example of that. So here's the domain, the robot delivery domain that we presented before. And the idea is the robot wants to get from 0103 at the bottom here up to um, R123, and it can start at and it can maybe explore shortcuts through the labs and maybe it can go around the corridor or go different other ways. It tries to get to, it's trying to get from one location to another. It's sort of a typical searching problem of trying to get from a robot from one position to another. Okay, does that make sense what we're trying to do? And then what we do is we abstract it into this notion of a graph. People know what a graph is, who's seen a graph? Who hasn't seen a graph? All right. So a graph is just a set of nodes and a set of ordered pairs of nodes. Um, node n2 is a neighbor of 1 if there's an arc from n1 to n2. A path is a sequence of nodes such that each pair of them is an arc. The length of this path, of this path n1 to nk is k, so if you have k so the length of the path is just the number of arcs. And you know, it's given a set of start nodes and gold nodes. We're going to try and find a path from a start node to a gold node. OK? Yes? All right. Um, people usually work, use the term edge for an undirected edge, an arc for a directed edge. These are all directed. Okay, this is a directed graph. OK, so these are one place to another. Other questions? Alright. So what we're going to do then is, is we're going, so in this case here, what we're going to do is we're going to have, we're going to pick some of the locations here as nodes. And we're going to have arcs correspond to different ways you can walk, you can traverse here, and here there are costs on the arcs. So we can go from 0103, we can go up to B3, so we're going to essentially choose some of these locations in here, the ones in bold, as nodes, so we have nodes and locations, we're going to be able to move between them, we can move from 0103 to B3 through that door, and we can move from 0103 to 0109, we can't move directly to B1, so there's just this, where we can move directly from corresponds to now. Okay, so this corresponds to a single action you can do from 0103 to B3 or from 0103 to TS. So each of those arrows gets to be an arc. Okay, so this is pretty 
reasonable about what we're doing. Let's look at this other map. So if I ask Google Maps to find me to get from um, let me show this. If I get from the computer science building to Stanley Park, it can find a path in here. Okay. Let's start. It's one of the nodes here. So we're going to abstract it's one of the nodes. Right, so nodes here can be intersections. Okay, so nodes here are intersections, what are arcs? Buses. Mm -hmm. Buses. The bus routes. Well, they could be, they're not all bus routes. This is not a hmm? Well, they're not, is it? Well, some of you asked you there, there. I don't know how I'm saying go. Car or bus? I can't tell. I can't tell either. I think it has both. It's both. Uh, no, it has one hour and one minute by bus, I think. It has both. So what are the arcs? Yeah. Right, so there are little street segments correspond to the arcs. There are one-way streets and there are two-way streets. Okay? And what's the distance measure? What the, is the cost measure on these? Yeah. What else might it be? The time, okay? So you can measure all sorts of things, yeah? Well, no, it's trying. What's, it, what's the distance between two things? Is the time. Right, well, gets the time from traffic conditions. So a lot of what it does is it learns estimates of time from traffic conditions. When it's abstracted out of this graph, the arc is just the time. So it's trying to minimize time. Okay, does that make sense? There's an, so Google Maps is just a big graph searching algorithm on top of this graphs. You can actually, um, you can't get their maps, but there are free maps you can download. They're basically just line segments. They're full of just, just big graphs. Okay. Um, let's have a look. So here's another example. There's um, two rooms and one cleaning robot. The rooms can be clean or dirty. And the robot actions that can suck and um, so I can make the room that the robot's in clean and it can move to the other room and the goals can be have both rooms clean. Okay, so what is the state specified here? What's the state here? What do you care about? Clean or dirty? Right, so, so what clean or dirty? So there's, there's each room can be clean or dirty, right? Yeah. Clean or dirty. What else is there? So what about? Well, the name of the room isn't going to change. Well, no, well, there are states and there are actions. No, well, there are actions as arcs correspond to actions, remember? Yeah. The current location of the robot. Anything else? Yeah. The robot capacity level? Hmm? Oh, this is going to be simpler than that. Yeah, we're doing a much simpler problem. We'll get to that in a second. We'll do an example of that in a second. This is much simpler than you. This is really simple, right? There's a, there are two rooms. There's dirt in this one, and dirt in this one. There's a robot that looks like a um, male robot that looks like a um, robot. <laughs> And it can move to and it can move to another state. Right, it can move to another state, and it's still dirty, right? And the robots in this state. That's the move action, right? 
and it can clean. <coughs> what, happens, what's true, what happens in this state? So I would switch each room to the clean or dirty, so what happens now? Okay, this is clean, this is dirty, and the robots. Okay. Make sense? How many states are there? Any other suggestions? Yeah. Six. Any other suggestions? Three. All right. A, B, C, D. <laughs> this is a democracy, isn't it? All right. Let's see what people think. How many states? Most people said B. Most people said B. B turns out to be the right answer. Because there's two states for this room. And there's two states for this room, and there's two places for the robots. So there's two times two times. So there's two states for room one. Two. Let's say two um, cleanliness states for two. Rooms, there's two um, values for two, for room one. There's two different values for room two, and there's two locations for the robot. And that's you're going to multiply them. Is eight eight. Okay. Um, what percentage? Um, Three quarters of the people got this. Okay, it's it's sort of pretty easy to draw the eight. This is clean the robots there. Then it can move. From here it can clean. And ends up in the state with the robots to the right side. And from here, we can then move, right, or we can clean, which is this other state. That's dirty in the robot there. And then it can move. So it's there and the robot there. Move again. And from here it can clean, I think. What is that right? Here it can clean. Is that the same state as that? No. No, okay. You're in a different position. And I can move to and from. Does that make sense? So it might be the case that this is the start state. And both of these are gold states. Right, we don't care whether it's clean or not, we only care about whether we don't care if it's clean, we only care about whether it's where the robot is, we just care whether it's clean. And what we're gonna try and do is to find a path through here. What's a path through here? Well a few paths to get to there, we can do this path. 
right? So we're going to clean, move. But there are other things. It could move, and then it can move back again and keep moving. Then it could go down here and clean. Then it can wander around again. It comes to here and clean, and then go down here. Okay, so there's lots of different paths through here. We might want the shortest path, or some path that's associated with cost. Okay, yes? Um, since there's a lot of like mirror states, could one ever make the argument that since some states are analogically equivalent, then you could eliminate some of the states from this uh, set of states? Like when you move, you're not really you're just changing your position, but the state of the world is necessarily changed. So you could maybe in some way bring back the same state. Yeah. So lots of the techniques that people use for actually solving these things is to recognize symmetries to do exactly what you're suggesting. Respectively, say we don't like this state space. Let's just have a an agent which has talks about the room it's in and the other room, right? So if I have a, this thing which either has the room I'm in or the other room, then either there's only four states. Then the room I'm in is dirty or clean. The other room is dirty or clean, and I can there's a bit of a different way of swapping, right? So if I have this other right way, I actually end up with four states. Okay, but, but a lot of things when people solve games, for example, you really exploit symmetry. A lot of the problems that people solve, they exploit the symmetries in there. See, so just because someone gives you this abstract definition of a, of a state doesn't mean you should necessarily just use that all the time. People are often creative in how to create states. Any other questions? a game where Rob needs to collect coins C1, C2, C3, and C4, and has to not run out of fuel and end up at location 1-1. One, one. Okay, so, so in here, suppose there are, it's a 10 by 10 grid, there are four coins, and there's possible, and it can have um, a full robot has 20 units of fuel and uses up one of each step. And there are these four points. Oh, that's really Does that make sense what the game is? You got to collect coins and get run up around out of fuel and get to a particular position. So what's a state? How do you represent a state? Just the location of everything on the grid. Well, the states could be a location of everything on the grid. You need that too. Whoops, I should write big issue. Can you read at the back? Can you read that? Sort of. I'll make it bigger. Could do that. We could do the state is um is the entire grid. What else might you want? Is 
that enough information? Which states by where well, let's start. What else would you need in this state? Well, has the smallest state space. Yeah. The one with the without the location of the current has the smallest state space. Which is this, right. One, two, or three. These are different, right? Yeah. What do we actually mean by the entire grid? Because our state is obviously going to try to represent everything in a grid, but that's not really telling us much. I don't know, someone else said that. Ask them. <laughs> enough information to be able to work out what's Oh you mean instead of this one you're gonna have this work about which coin, because you need to get the coins. I'm not sure about the coins, because you don't know from your local where you are now when you collected the coin way over there. Yeah. 
Where? What do you mean? I don't think that anything is enough information to actually work out what it's going to do. You need enough information to work out what I'm going to do and how to solve the goal. That's what I'm trying to do. I want enough information so I know what to to check whether there's a solution. I'm distracted this problem. I want to get enough information so I can work out where am I now, what can I do, and what can I have the goal. I want to ignore all the other details that are absolutely relevant. Yeah. The coins are different locations. It's, yeah, the coins are different. So they're not necessarily in the same place every time. Um, for one game. Yeah, for one game, there is, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, does the robot know where the coins are? Um, yes, it's fully observable. Yeah, then we don't need to know the full state of the grid, and we don't even need to know how much gold we have. We don't even know if we're empty or empty or not. Because and the robot needs to have like an algorithm to find the most efficient path to collect all the coins. Right, but when it's finding the path, what are the nodes in the path oh, in the arc? Okay. That's what we're going to do. We're going to find the path in this thing. They collect all the coins and come back. But we have to know what this graph is in order to do this. Yeah. Um, I just remember one you said we probably don't need to know how many coins we collect, right? That would be if they wanted to do exactly the same thing. You say you know the location of everything on the grid versus having the entire grid of memory, but the same information. So. Yeah, probably. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, what if you just saw some couple that had like the location um, and the number of coins that the robot currently has and the level of fuel? And then since the robot knows what the other coins are, it can travel based on some current decisions. Right, but that's the no what coins, it still has to get, not just how many. in number three, you have the x position, the y position, how much fuel you have, and where you have all these coins. And I can move from, I think that's five, eight, with six amounts of fuel with, I don't have coin one, I do have coin two. So there's enough information to be able to work out what a goal is. So we need enough information to work out a goal. So a goal in this representation is, you have to be at position one, one, and it has to, all the others have to be true, you don't care how much fuel you have at the end. So you can actually easily set up a situation about saying what it is that you, um, that you want in this representation. Then we can just search through this graph, we can, act, we can move to the left, we can move um, we can move um, up, down and right. Right, and if you move up and then left, you might have so they move up and it's the left hand branch, then the one down there shows you move left. So then we can fill up with fuel. So now we have we're in four, nine, and twenty, and now we can wander off. And as we wander off, in other ones we're using up fuel. Does that make sense? This is a reasonably simple state space of try, just using this third one we're trying to represent in terms of what information we need to do in order to be able to solve this problem and be able to draw arcs. It's pretty easy to define an arc in this representation. Right, you either add one plus one as long as it's legal. If you land in a coin, think it's going to make it true, and it's easy to specify the goal. Um, does that make sense? How many states are there? Hmm? How many states are there? Just tell me how to calculate it. Don't you? Hmm? 32,000. Is that right? 
land on top of it, you get fuel. What? No, it's just this, it's this state. The fueling state is this one here, the 49, all of a sudden it gets to 4920. Which mark is this one? On the left hand side, the 4920 is the fueling place. So you go from 595, you go, to the, you go left, you get fuel, then you go right to go to 5, 9, and then you have 19. So that's really complicated, doesn't it? Yeah. Do we need another um, variable in that to show either the location of the fuel cell or if it's in that square? I'm sort of assuming that it knows where the fuel is observed, where the fuel is. I, I can write this sort of graph. I know before I start, the fuel is here. Yeah, that's why I subtracted two, but people objected to that. I said there were two of these 10 by 10 you couldn't reach, but that's fine. Boy, you didn't get a really good calculation anyway, because you, you can't actually get to the states that have 20 fuel a long way from the fuel. OK? Does that make sense? We're going to use this notion of a graph to abstract a lot of these different sort of problems that we're going to start searching through. What is the minus two again? Oh, that's for the two, um, that's for these two blanks. These two states are blanked out. You couldn't pass through. Right, so these are the two, these are the two unreachable bridge points. algorithm that given such a problem, given such a graph, given a graph, given the start node, the goal node, it's going to incrementally explore the path from the start node. And it's going to maintain what we call frontier of paths from the start node that have been explored. And as the search proceeds, the front node expands into unexplored nodes until a goal node is encountered. And the way in which this, the frontier is expanded actually defines a search strategy. So we're going to have this frontier and keep expanding it into some into new unexplored areas. And when we found the path, we're going to report it. That's what we're going to do here. So, so here's so here's a sort of a graph of this. We've got the the path. Of the frontier is going to be the set of paths. Okay. And then we're going to start from the start. Now we have some nodes that we've explored. We're going to have the unexplored nodes. We don't know where they are. Where they are. We're going to just, each time of the steps, you're going to grab one of these nodes on the frontier and expand the frontier. Okay, so that's the idea of the, the generic search algorithm. 
and lots, and then basically all the algorithms we're going to use variations on that about how to actually go about choosing which node to explore. So on. One of the, you know, so one of the tools that people, um, summer students have done, um, and URSAs have built over various summer of um, people who, students who have graduated from 322, what's called aispace.org, is this little applet that actually lets us explore state spaces of this. So this actually lets us see just before we, so this is the graph we saw before. And the algorithm works, it's going to select a node, and here I, the Gnoli node I can select is this green node, and it's going to have the new frontier is this three nodes, TS, B3, and 0109. So you just have a node, you can select the node on the frontier, and then we're going to add its neighbors to the frontier. So here's the algorithm. We're going to select a node, like this node here, we're going to select it, and we have a new frontier, so with the old nodes of the frontier are drawn in green, the new nodes are drawn in blue. And as we select the node from the frontier, we're going back, so if I select TS from this frontier, it's going to remove it from the frontier and add its neighbors to the frontier. So now we have a new frontier that consists of male B1, B4, and O109. We can pick B2 next from the frontier. We're going to expand this frontier. We have the current path, which is 0103 to B3. We're just going to keep expanding this in some way until we reach a goal node. Okay, so we can now expect, choose one of these. We choose this one. And it turns out that once we've chosen this one, there are two different paths on this thing to B4. That's why there's the shade behind it, because there are multiple paths to it that are on the frontier. And now we can keep expanding nodes. In fact, it doesn't matter what order we choose them in. We can make it so that this one doesn't have any nodes. We can keep choosing them until some time. We actually select all the nodes, and we actually select the goal node, and then we find the solution. And what we're going to try and do is to develop ways about how can we go about selecting nodes efficiently to actually solve problems. And that's what we're going to do next time. All right. Thank you.